one of the things that I did read in the book uh, was that you dealt with anxiety when you were younger. How did you yeah. work to overcome that? You know, uh, I was young enough that it was my parents that did it. And they, they just said, you know, we're not, first of all, they couldn't afford the medication that the doctor had suggested. And they also felt like, you know, the doctor had said that I think she's just spoiled and, and high anxiety ridden. And, and they thought, well, we know she's not spoiled. So maybe his medical advice wasn't as on target either. And they said, there's ways to handle anxiety and we're gonna do it hands on. And so if they saw me getting spun up about a test or something at school, they would just say, you know, I really need you to help me you know, move the timber or bale the hay or move the hay or whatever it is. And could you put your jeans on and just help me today? And then you can get back to school tomorrow. Kind of like I was doing them a big favor. And just that realize, it, first of all, getting busy, not sitting still and letting your mind wrap around it, getting your hands and feet busy and mind busy with something else and helping me realize also that school, peer pressure, things like that, they're, they really only have as much control over you as you allow them. And they were the ones that handled it, not me, but it was a great example. Do you remember the first time that you thought, I want to be a pilot? Yes. I was, um, I was doing some chore. I think I was with my mom in the, in the garden, or I was cleaning out stock trailers and stalls. But I remember just taking the time to, to look. We'd seen the jets overhead practicing their dog fighting many times. But I remember just pausing and, and saying, Mom, that's what I want to do. And, um, and then I started reading, trying to find books, and found a great book called Jungle Pilot about Nate Saint, who was Jim Elliott's pilot down in Ecuador. And reading that book was just um, eye-opening. I felt like I finally got to see aviation from behind a pilot's eyes, not just to see it from the ground looking up, but from the cockpit looking out. And that's one of the reasons I am so excited about the junior reader that's coming out, Nerves of Steel, because it was in junior high that I really set my path towards aviation. What did your parents say when you said, this is what I want to do, I want to be a pilot? Were they supportive? Were they, what was kind of their reaction? Well, they had two different reactions, both, I think, along the same vein. My mom said, oh, Tammy Jo, those people are smart. <laughs> and not meaning I wasn't, <laughs> not meaning I wasn't, but she just thought, I have no idea. None of, I had never met a pilot. She'd never flown or met a pilot. And I think she just thought, I, I don't know what it takes to do that. And my dad just said, could you hand me another you know, tool? <laughs> he really just like, oh yeah, sure. That sounds good, Tammy Jo. Uh, because I, I had other ideas too that really weren't, I, I didn't have the skill set for. So they were kind enough to tell me, I don't think that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you end up making it happen? Can you take me through the process a little bit sure. of how you got to being a pilot? Well, so I saw it, first of all. I don't think we ever dream about doing something we haven't seen or at least a, a, a window into. And then reading about it certainly put um, the puzzle pieces together for me. And then um, just following up on it at career day in high school, they said, oh, sorry, girls don't fly. And so I went home thinking, all right, then I'll go to plan B in life. And not stopping to just say, no, I am going to do it no matter what. I thought, okay, well, I need a college education no matter what I plan on doing. So I went on with that. And then just kind of keeping my eyes open for anything aviation, even though I thought I was going to become a veterinarian. And seeing a woman get her wings at Vance Air Force Base, uh, I went up and talked to her. And then I just determined, okay, if she can find a way in, there's got to be a way in. And I, I got turned down by the Air Force recruiters three times. They wouldn't even let me take the test. The Army said I wasn't a fit for them. And the Navy did at least let me take the test. But it took me two more years to find a recruiter that would process the test. So, but in that time, I didn't sit still. And that is one of the things I would really like to encourage people in. If you get told no, you may be able to find uh, a window, uh, you know, a hole under the fence, but keep your feet moving. I mean, don't, don't sit still. 
And that takes perseverance. How did you find that when you're getting roadblocked at every single turn? Right. You know, I, I think being grounded in my faith, um, there were so many, I, I look at kind of the Old Testament figures as well as New Testament figures and realize that many of them did not succeed when they first tried. And then you read stories, true stories. I loved nonfiction growing up and seeing the true stories of people that were turned down, turned away, and just kept building their personal resume and fortitude in other ways. And, and then at the end of the day, I really spent it kind of putting those dreams before the Lord and, and thought, you know, I don't want to be this just mindless dreamer. Do I have the skill set? You know, what's my motive for being there? Do I have the merit to be there? And when I finished just putting it before the Lord, I always got up from my knees feeling like, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Tell me about when you were accepted into the Navy. What, mm -hmm. what was your reaction to that? What were your, your parents' reaction to that? Um, by that time, they were definitely on board with me flying. They saw how long and how hard I had tried for years. And so they were excited. I had gone back to grad school, so my girlfriends at grad school threw me a party and we all watched uh, Officer and a Gentleman before I headed off to AOCS. Such a good choice. It, there's not that much time. There was all kinds of romance in the movie. There's no such time there. <laughs> <laughs> not realistic. Nor could I imagine myself uh, with a shaved head. It, but that, of course, happened and my, uh, my mom said, don't send any more pictures home until you grow some hair. You're scaring your brother and sister. <laughs> so. And you became one of the first female fighter pilots in the Navy. I mean. Well, actually not one of the first fighter pilots. The Navy was amazingly uh, ahead of time. They opened their doors for women to earn their wings years before the Air Force did. And then they had women in tactical roles. Now, I was one of the first women to fly F-18s. Um, so uh, that was certainly exciting. Now, when you're you know, in the first wave, you usually have to cut the trail. And so that's always a little difficult, besides learning to fly the jet. Um, yeah, talk a little bit about that. I mean, I can, you know, you're a woman really truly going into a man's world. How difficult was it? You know, I, I will have to say I flew with some prince among men. Um, just, I think about my first F-18 instructor, Mike Frischy, and I, I was just in awe of his, of his manners as well as his aviation skills. But he was the last friendly face I saw there. And um, it, was, it was difficult. Uh, it's complicated because when you're cutting that swath through the jungle, it usually r requires a machete. And, but you don't want to negate that ability to have some camaraderie with people. And so trying to navigate that and, um, and stay out of some people's radar. And then once you're in the crosshairs as we speak, you know, where they really are targeting you. Um, making sure your skill set stays up to par, but also learning how to maneuver. And one of the, one of the um, recommendations from my skipper, who she was in the first class of women to ever fly in the military, in the Navy, and she said, use your sense of humor first. That's what you use first. And then go about it in the quietest way you can, so that when it's all over and you're still standing, so are they and you can both proceed on. So as an example, um, I did a, my instrument check ride in a simulator, which is what everyone does. And afterwards, my instructor, instead of grading me, he went, launched into a tirade about how it wasn't right for me to be in the same aircraft as him, a warrior. And I, I thought he used the term rather loosely because he had never been to war. We did have uh, pilots within our squadron who had been, but he just was very set on telling me how it was not right for me to be there. And, and I finally had to tell him, I have a four plane formation flight that I'm supposed to brief in so many minutes. I do need you to go ahead and resolve the grades so I can move on. And he did, but then he called me later that night having, um, I think, fortified with some, some 
some drinking and his buddies and said, you know what, it's not right. I refuse to grade you as a woman. You have no right to be in this cockpit and I refuse to grade you. And so this started quite the uh, snowball effect in my, he, my whole training jacket disappeared. So they had to stop my training until they found my training jacket, who, which had mysteriously disappeared. And anyway, uh, it, things like that happened. Was there ever a point where you felt like giving up? Uh, no, I guess, you know, growing up with brothers and around hired hands, you kind of feel like, okay, the, the harder you push, the more I lean into it. So, you know, getting pushed around, I think, sometimes has the opposite effect. So um, it, it doesn't do any good, but strengthen you a little bit, kind of like the wind does an oak. You know, the stronger it, it blows, the stronger the oak grows. <laughs> so. Let's transition a little bit into mm -hmm. when you got out of the Navy and you started flying commercial planes. What was that sure. like? Sure. Well, and when I was in the Navy, to just to start there, it was a huge transition time because we, I flew in the swath of time and among the ladies that Congress was looking at lifting the uh, combat exclusion policy from aviators only. So Pam, uh, Carol, and I went through A7 weapons before women were flying in combat. And we were kind of in the test zone of women. So there was a lot of changes coming along and changes always unsettled people. And there's a bit of a, a mini culture war uh, in aviation and among aviators going on. And that that of course went throughout aviation, not just military aviation, but every civilian cockpit, it was a topic as well. And so coming to Southwest during that time, uh, and also during that time, there was the added turbulence of commercial aviation had realized, you know, the, king, the, the captain operating as a king without a Magna Carta is not, is not good. We need, co we need crew cohesiveness, we need um, CRM, crew resource management in, in the cockpit. So, you know, there was a little, ch there was that change going on as well. So when I got to Southwest, there was a, a bit of um, unsteadiness in just the attitudes mm -hmm. within the cockpit. Were people intimidated that you had flown fighter jets and you were coming in to do this job? You know, I don't think I'd use the word intimidated. I think there were some very resentful and uh, either they had flown something that they they didn't like or their buddy hadn't gotten a fighter seat in the Air Force. I don't know how that had anything to do with me in the Navy, but you know, those, those lines of reason kind of get blurred sometimes when we want to be resentful and we finally find an object to be resentful against. <laughs> And so I felt like a little bit of a lightning rod on that. In a way, I, it almost seems like as I'm talking to you, your career has, it's almost always been like that. You go from <laughs> being in the Navy to Southwest. I mean, is that frustrating? How do you cope with that? I feel like over right. the course of years, that's got to get tiring. It does. It does. And um, I will say, it was just the attitude and the actions of a few, not the many. Or, or I think I would have checked into a different line of work but you can see that it's in isolated incidents. Um, whenever someone in management level, whether in the Navy or Southwest, has that attitude and takes those actions, of course, it has more repercussions. But I could definitely see it was isolated. It was, the Navy uh, was much too noble for that kind of behavior. They were moving on. And Southwest also, um, they, they had a bigger mission than, than petty attitudes. And so those were, those were groomed out and moving on. So take me to April, was it 2018? 17, 17. yes. Uh, you know, you're right, 2018. 2018. Tell me about that day. Uh, you and your husband had actually switched yes. shifts. Yes, he's a captain with Southwest also. And our son, who was a senior, had a track meet that I'm, I'm his throwing coach and I'm his mom. So of course, I wanted to go to that. But Dean was such a gentleman and switched so that I could go to the track meet. And that's why I was flying his flight that day. And takes off as a routine flight. Tell me when yeah. you know something's going wrong. Well, we felt like we'd been hit by another aircraft. So we knew, exa we knew exactly when something happened. And it was like getting uh, T-boned by a Mack truck. There was an explosion, but there was always such a, a violent volt, uh, jolt at the time. 
And the aircraft went into a snap roll to the left. And Darren and I both grabbed the controls, leveled the wings. But by the time we did that, then there was such an increasing shudder to the aircraft because of the damage to the, the engine cowling and the wing. And also there was some smoke pulled in from the explosion into the cockpit. And we couldn't communicate because a window had been blown out and 500 mile an hour wind makes a, a roar. We couldn't even under, we couldn't hear ourselves uh, communicating, let alone the other person. And then we had a, a stabbing pain in our in our ears and realized we're not breathing either. <laughs> and so we knew that something in the cabin had been compromised. We didn't know where or what. Um, and the shuddering, we really couldn't. Uh, put our finger on what all was causing that, but obviously damage to the outside of the aircraft. And adrenaline kicks in at a time like that, when you can't hear, you can't really focus your eyes on anything, and you can't breathe. And I remember just having that good news, bad news ideas in my mind, and the bad news being, I don't know that everything will stay on the aircraft that we need to fly. Which, when you take that thought process and follow it out, uh, you know, I thought, this this may be the day that I meet my maker. And at that point, I mentally just stopped short of that cliff of what if and thought, you know, if that's the case, then I won't be meeting a stranger because I meet with him every day. And that's really where I, I felt a calm uh, that followed me through the rest of the flight. And I think it's reflected in my voice, but it's a calm heart that I needed to make and changed our plans all the way down. Darren and I had to change our idea of what we were going to do until we touched down. Um, and that was a gift. I, I don't think you get that just from training or experience. I think that was something that the Lord granted me at that point. I heard the audio recordings and your voice is so calm, so collected, that it, it's incredible. I mean, where do you wouldn't even know where to begin in a situation like that. Where do you find that calm when you are thinking this could be it? Right. Well, and when you think this could be it and your answer is, well, then I'm ready. Then you can move on. And I had incredible crew. Darren Elliser, my first officer, he, he was amazing in all that he did. We switched. He continued flying initially because uh, even though we couldn't communicate, it was his flight, and so I looked at him, gave him the nod, and took my hands off, so he knew he was in control, because the worst thing is to have two people trying to control the same airplane. And then um, I made a PA to the passengers and the flight attendants that we're not going down, we're going into Philly, because even though it was startling to Darren and I, I know it had to be mind-numbing uh, frightening to those in the back because you don't know and we we lost 19,000 feet in the first five minutes so it was you know it was diving um, we continued to turn towards Philadelphia but I wanted them to know that we had a plan and a destination and that's when the flight attendants unbuckled Shanique Mallory Rachel Fernheimer Catherine Sandoval buckled up like they should be but when they heard that we had a destination um, and they could see people struggling, not having their oxygen masks over their noses and struggling to breathe with them just over the mouth. They unbuckled and faced a very rough uh, ride, bruised, uh, lacerated, uh, sprained back, bruised ribs, uh, you name it, just from doing that. And, and then on the way down, uh, whenever it was discovered that the window that had blown out, there was someone that had been pulled partially out and passengers uh, three in particular, Tim McGinty, Andrew Needham, stepped up, left their oxygen masks and their families, unbuckled and went toward a window that they had no idea if more was going to be torn out. And they weren't buckled in to help a stranger. And then Peggy Phillips, who got up to give CPR on the way down. And I just, I have to say that was an, such a testimony to to the people of that flight. And when we landed, there, there was a hush and a calm. O often when something like that happens and we land, people are very uh, vocal about their displeasure in what had happened, which they had the right to be upset about. But also, they're ready to get off. 
And everyone, when they heard that there was a medical emergency, they absolutely were calm and helping each other. Um, and, and I just, I have said before, I think the value of human life was felt that day and that in, in our culture, and not that we're perfect because we're not a perfect people, but there is a sense of value of human life. No one on that airplane knew Jennifer and she knew no one and yet everyone felt the value of her and, and gave her that respect that you would a sister. And speaking of that value, it's a heavy responsibility when you're in the cockpit and there are all these lives on board that essentially you're responsible for. Mm -hmm. How do you manage that at the same time? You know, I, I manage it one step at a time and I think and pray about the passengers before I leave my hotel room because I know I have other people's precious cargo on board. But once I get there and I shut the cockpit door, then I'm about flying because that's how I take care of those passengers. And um, having flight attendants like Rachel, Shanique, and Catherine, I don't have to worry about the passengers. I know they are as taken care of as can be, beyond even my imagination. So that's the nice thing about having such an incredible crew, is I can focus on my job. When you look back at everything that has happened, what kind of goes through your head? Because a lot. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a lot to process af immediately after, but even in the months and years that follow. Right. And you know, that really uh, comes back to the book. One of the things that Darren and I found when we went back to listen to the cockpit voice recorder there in D.C. at the National or the NTSB headquarters, neither one of us was looking forward to it, but we're the only two that are allowed to listen to it. So we felt like, all right, we'll go. And we listened to things, heard things, were able to put so many things together, missing pieces of the puzzle in our mind together, that we walked out of there going, I can't believe we even thought of not going and not getting those puzzle pieces. And then the black box information came out and you read through that and you can understand a little more of what happened. And so I think the few chapters, there's only about three chapters in the whole book that deal with it towards the end. But I hope for those that were on the flight, and their families, that it fills in some of those, those puzzle pieces that are missing, and so you can never put the puzzle together and set it aside. And, and so they can get the cockpit point of view, what was going on in the cockpit, what we knew, what we didn't know, and then also the cabin. Um, Andrew Needham takes time to give us what was going on in the cabin. And so I hope that that helps, because that helped us. You get all those pieces together, and instead of this puzzle that's adrift, you've got it all neatly, you can put it aside. Look at it when you want to, but it does not, it does not pull on your mind. How crucial do you think your fighter pilot training was in this particular instance? Right, you know, I think, I think it was crucial for me. I fly with a lot of civilian pilots that are amazing. So, you know, for me, that was the training I needed. And I had especially, a year that was really kind of um, a backhanded assignment by a skipper that said he wasn't going to allow women to teach guns in his squadron. So I was sent to teach out of control flight, which is going up 30,000 feet, departing the aircraft over and over and over again, and having the student recover if they can. If they can't, then I recover it, we do it again. And nobody even wanted to fly one of those flights, let alone teach it day after day for a year. And, but that was great training, and it was great training also. I felt like the Lord taught me a lesson in don't be offended when somebody treats you unfairly, get what you can out of the situation, and move on. You know, it didn't stop my career in the Navy. It was just a year of not getting to fly what everybody else, what all my peers were flying. But it was, it was probably the best training of my background. So. All right, let's talk about your book a little bit more. Sure. Um, what, when did you know you wanted to write a book and what was the precipitating factor? What made you think, yes, yeah. this is what I need to do? You know, I had never really thought about writing a book, but afterwards and realizing that we're never uh, creatures of one moment. You know, like my reactions during that flight were a culmination of a lot of things. Um, you know, it was experience, it was training, but it was also the choices 
that we make along the way because the, the choices we make are the habits that we create and those habits on a good day become instinct on a bad day. And so it made me look back a little more, more retrospective, retrospective and I realized, you know, I, I am going to put it down on paper and also just looking at how, um, you know, one item is not going to make or break our lives. You know, there are a lot of things that happened that were unfair. Uh, but I look at things that happened to my dad that was a rancher that was completely unfair. So life, life can be unfair. Um, it's how, how do we deal with it. And, and gleaning the, the good things out of it, I think some of the tough characters, the, the ornery characters that I came across, they, they helped, uh, helped groom me. Even though that wasn't their object, um, God has this upside down economy and way of doing things that he can turn the things that were not meant for good into something useful. That's so true. Um, what do you hope that people reading this take away from it? I hope the takeaway is, I mean, I hope the takeaway is encouragement. I think that it is a, a, a call to resilience, that, that we're created resilient. So I also think we're created with um, a very real and healthy need for adventure in our life. And adventure will always have a bit of adversity. And that adversity is really part of the grooming to make us ready for even bigger and better adventures and challenges ahead. Any message to young women or young girls yeah. who want to be pilots, who want to go into the military even? Right. Um, you know, it, I, we're seeing this big push forward for women in STEM. What's right. your message to those little girls? You know, one of the things I would say is keep being a girl. I mean, the things that we do as girls really groom us for, to be pilots, engineers, things like that. And you don't have to check your girl card to do it. You can, you can be as much a girl as you want to and be an engineer, to be a pilot, to be an air traffic controller. That it's, you know, for me, I look back and I think that time spent in band and sports and tumbling and cheerleading or whatever, uh, those are all things that I actually used in piloting. And just as the men use their experiences, and we bring something different to the table. That's one of the things I'd really like to get into girls' heads is we're, we bring something different to the table, and it's good. And so it's, it's such a great profession. And you will have the time to do the other things you want to do as a woman, you know, whether it's marry, have a family, or other things you will have the time to do those and and be a pilot it's just your set of priorities and i know it's not a perfect field yet but no. there is change there is change big it, change it's so much more progressive than it used to be and i think women are far more accepted that's got to make you feel good when you look at it from the outside it does and one of the things that i love about aviation and stem is the fact that it's built on facts you know gravity doesn't have favorites and so your skill set is built on on just uh, physics and and so you you know there are there were definitely big attitudes the wasps dealt with it you know and every generation has different attitudes that they deal with but the doors are really open and so I would I would highly recommend the field tell me about the junior reader oh the junior reader has my heart it's, it's shorter chapters, but even more stories than in my trade book. And it was a junior reader that put my feet on the path to aviation, reading the junior reader of Jungle Pilots about Nate Saint. And so getting to see aviation from a pilot's perspective, it, it really helped me because you can only grasp so much of a vocation or profession by watching it from the outside. But whenever you get to get behind the scenes and you get a cockpit view of it, then you, you get a taste for it and whether it fits you or not. And I think you'll see that. Uh, I've taken a lot of time to, to describe carrier landings, describe aviation. So you can look at it and see, hmm, I wonder if this is something that suits me. And you've done some work with girls oh, in yes. STEM. 
How does it make you feel when you see a little girl excited about possibly becoming a pilot? Oh, I, I just feel like they go into the world with blinders off. And I was, I was fortunate. I had a dad and brothers that treated me as an equal. There wasn't any question about it. I was given the same responsibilities, the same authorities, and the same accolades. So it wasn't until I stepped into the real world that I realized, oh my goodness, there's a big difference out here. And so I, you know, and then having a faith that doesn't have second class citizens in it, it was, it was great to step into the world thinking, okay, you know, I can dream without fences. And so seeing young ladies, whether it's little girls or college girls that just go, you know what, the, it, it's really up to me to choose. Anything you want to add that I haven't asked you? Oh, you know, just uh, as a as a capstone, I would say, you know, dreams. Uh, that word has been used so many times in so many ways, but I want to use it in its purest form, which is a a thought of an adventure. You know, because you never just step up and do something. You think about it first, and so that's what I consider dreaming when you're thinking about something. And that's just the starting pistol. It's the road ahead. It's taking action and the road ahead that prepares you for that to, uh, to morph into something more than just the thought.